way to think something like cost rental over generations. And okay, keep, ladies. Keeping it as cost rental is really important. Yeah. We're chatting away here and there's been a great debate going on and um, everybody, we're just waiting on Ivan to come in. He's having a couple of um, of uh, technical difficulties. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's going to get in in the next minute or two, the message, the, 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 the link has gone to him again. Uh, for those who've joined us this evening, you're all very welcome. And um, this is a public meeting on behalf of the Carlo Kilkenny Labour Party. Um, and uh, I suppose it's really an attempt to focus on what is the most important um, issue of our time, as far as we're concerned as a party. Um, and uh, a number of our councillors are, are are tuned in watching tonight um, and just one second I think we have Ivan about to join us um, uh, so uh, we have Tomas Bernach I know is is, is uh, on the line and watching in and I suppose just to let people know this is the second meeting we've had in a week on this subject and I'm, I'm not referring to the very successful Labour Party conference at the weekend I'm referring to I suppose an unusual and and um, a heartwarming uh, contribution we got. We've actually had Michelle and, and Rebecca aren't aware of this, but uh, we've taken um, an approach in the last couple of months that um, we have started engaging directly with the County Council and um, through our through Tomas in particular as our councillor and Dennis on, uh, on Kilkenny County Council. And we've actually had two um, uh, meetings directly with council officials, the last of which was last Wednesday night when Mary Mulholland, who's the Director of Services in Kilkenny County Council, um, joined us for a, a party meeting uh, where she discussed some of the stark facts of, of the housing issues um, in County Kilkenny. And in particular, I suppose, I'm sure that both Michelle and Rebecca and Ivan will be aware of this, um, of the pending difficulties that there are in relation to um, rentals. And I know that Rebecca has been doing a lot of work on this. Um, but a very stark figure, I suppose, that we were given is that 53 Kilkenny families uh, face eviction between now and Christmas, largely as a result of the lifting of the eviction ban. And, um, you know, that would mean that there would be an excess of 100 people, of 100 families in Kilkenny um, on the emergency housing waiting list um, between now and Christmas. And when you take the fact that the one main and the main um, emergency uh, accommodation provider um, is uh, that the um, the the uh, that the the issues around that uh, that the the uh, main emergency provider is the Good Shepherd Centre in Kilkenny City is currently full and there are no places for the people who are there at the moment to go. Therefore, we're, we we you know we we have real um, live uh, difficulty and crisis on our hands. Uh, in Kilkenny. So I suppose the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our two speakers, um, both of whom I've known for longer than I is. it would be uh, safer to admit. I think probably Michelle a bit longer than I've known Rebecca. Um, and uh, Michelle, uh, as I had forgotten before tonight, of course, is a, a woman from Pilltown in South Kilkenny. And I'm quite sure Tomas Bernock is going to be very pleased uh, with that, given that um, uh, that Michelle's uh, relatives live within his electoral area down in South Kilkenny, and um, uh, but has been, uh, I suppose, has been in the academic field uh, for a long time in University College Dublin, uh, director of the Geary Institute on um, on public affairs, um, and has been hugely active and very impressively active on the housing issue over the last number of years. Uh, Rebecca Moynihan has been a long time, um, uh, even though she doesn't, she looks far too young to be a long time anything, um, activist uh, within the Labour Party, um, having been a councillor uh, and a uh, doll candidate on, I think, two occasions, if I'm right, Rebecca, one occasion sure. so far um, uh, in uh, Dublin South Central, which is one of my old constituencies. And um, Rebecca, uh, we were delighted that Rebecca was um, elected to Shannon Aaron after the last uh, general election, uh, joining a small but very impressive team uh, in Shannon Aaron. And the most recent success of which, of course, is Ivana Bacic, who uh, was elected in the Dublin Bay South um, elections in um, uh, June. 
and uh, Ivana, of course, um, also hugely interested and hugely active on the housing issue uh, over the years with a particular concern uh, to those of her own constituency, but more generally um, uh, in, in the whole housing issue uh, nationally. So um, just give me one sec. Okay, and I don't seem to, let me see. We hope we might have Ivan back. We'll try again. Um, and we'll see if we have him in. Um, the joys of technology, much and all, is, as we're used to Zoom, there are different things on Zoom that work and that don't work. So we seem to have you there, Ivan. Um, it's coming up as Colette's name, but we'll accept that. And if you want to unmute yourself and stick on the camera, we'll see how, how we're getting on. Are you there, Ivan? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, we can hear you. We can't see you yet in all your glory, Ivan. Okay. Uh, uh, but I will do the introductions for Ivan at this point. Okay, uh, there we go. There we go. We're all, we're all, we're all in action. And um, uh, Ivan Shannon is from a long-established uh, building and development family would be the best way to put it, Ivan, um, in Kakenny City, um, a, a family who played a part in, in building quite a number of private houses, and uh, many of which would have ended up um, by accident or design in the rental sector. Um, and I even now describes himself more as uh, as a landlord uh, than than uh, at the other end uh, of of the business. And he can tell us a little bit uh, about that later on. Um, and uh, you know, I, Ivan is, is well known. Here, also has uh, carried out some academic study himself in relation to this with the Institute of Public Administration. If I'm right, Ivan, um, looking at uh, the issues around housing um, and its provision. Um, and I suppose uh, with that, maybe I will ask maybe uh, Rebecca to kick us off, if that's okay. And um, Rebecca, obviously, is party spokesperson in housing, which I didn't get around to saying, which is the most important thing, um, is, uh, is dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, some of our policies at the weekend at Labour Party conference, and um, we'll outline some of our priorities here tonight and where we think we should be going. Uh, we're not here tonight to all agree with each other. So if we have a debate, we have a debate. And within the Labour Party, we always welcome that. And we've deliberately, uh, in, in, in the context of Ivan, gone outside of the party and to try and get a perspective from somebody uh, who, has, who has a local perspective, but also, you know, a, a slightly different take maybe on where we're going. So Rebecca, Tosnog Melatsa, Mata Shishin Karkador. Um, thank you, Sean, um, and thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, it's great to be um, on uh, such a well-known panel, and particularly with somebody like um, Michelle, who is the absolute leader in her field um, in terms of the area of housing. Um, I wasn't expecting to kick off, um, and so I'm not sure how this debate is going to be framed, but I'll maybe go through um, a couple of the, 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 the core issues um, that I see. Um, and I suppose to start off, uh, the first is um, construction and construction capacity. Um, we are almost back to kind of pre-pandemic levels um, in terms of housing construction. They're talking about 9,000 houses in the first six months and 20,000 this year. Um, the governments in Housing for All are very much relying on a figure of 33,000 that came from the ESRI in terms of what we needed for housing construction over the next 10 years. Um, I am of the opinion, and I think um, a couple of academics uh, are also of the opinion that that's maybe too low and it's um, coming in around if we, we stay still, as opposed to if we have Im inward migration coming in um, and that actually population um, increases and we hit almost 5,000, uh, 5 million this year um, are going to mean that we need to significantly scale up even beyond the 33,000. Um, my big issue in terms of the breakdown of the 33,000 is, I suppose, the lack of ambition um, from both the state and local authorities in terms of what they're going to build. Um, so they're looking at about 10,000 units, um, relying on 2,000 of them um, as leasing units. Um, included in that is then an element of affordable purchase. Um, sorry, there's affordable purchase on, on, on top of that. But like during the COVID, COVID years, we hit about 10% of our social housing output. Now, understandable, that was COVID. That I think it caught up towards the end of the year and we'll see what, what, what is going to happen with this year. But I think there's a real reluctance 
Um, and I think Michelle's probably going to touch on it a little bit more. Um, and I know from a local authority perspective, from local authorities getting involved in building it and managing and maintaining um, social housing. So they've given quite ambitious targets to local, or they've given targets to local authorities for them to hit. Um, I think Dublin City Council is about 8,000 uh, units, but you're looking at Dublin City Council trying to sell off um, uh, the Oscar Trainer Road site again, um, and then buy it back. So I suppose this question is that if, if the City Council don't consider themselves, or local authorities don't consider themselves to have the capacity to deliver the housing targets that are being set for them, um, and if they also then don't consider themselves to have the finance available um, to not just build the bricks and mortar, but often the infrastructure that local communities then want built around it um, if you're building social housing and social um, housing projects. What is good news though, I think is um, the element of cost rental that's come in in the affordable housing bill. Um, I have a couple of concerns um, with it. Firstly, uh, they're looking at about 18,000 units up to 2030. Um, I think that's very low for the number of people that are going to be applying for cost rental. Um, and another part of it that I have difficulties with it that's built into bill, in the bill is that you're going to have um, an element of profit will be allowed and that's going to be set um, um, afterwards. But also after 40 years, you can apply to not um, be a cost rental uh, provider. So I'm a little bit worried that we're in the same, we'll get ourselves into the same situation that we have done with local council houses and in areas like mine in Crumlin, you're seeing ex council houses being sold for half a million euro. Um, and I do think it's important that if something is being built as cost rental, that it stays as cost rental, particularly if it has a large state subsidy through um, the site services fund. And then I suppose um, one of the areas that I think that we're also a laggard in, and up until now I haven't really seen much discussion around, are things like renters' rights um, and security or tenure for renters. Um, and we published a bill with Ivana Batrick and she asked very much in the Dublin South by-election um, to get a mandate uh, for that renters' rights bill. So we addressed things like issues like security of tenure. Um, so for example, um, at the moment, um, if I'm selling, uh, if I own this house and I'm moving out and I'm selling it to another landlord, I have a tenant, I'm selling it to another landlord, I can evict the tenant that is in there. Uh, we're removing that clause um, to be able to evict. Um, it, it, you wouldn't have vacant possession. Um, we're also restricting the um, number of people that you can evict on the basis um, of. Um, so at the moment, it's a wide network of family members. Uh, we're limiting it just to spouse or um, spouse or children. Um, and then we're addressing the issue of no-fault evictions um, so to try and create definite tenures, uh, tenancies of indefinite duration. Sorry, I'm getting caught here. Um, and then also looking at really small areas like standards um, of accommodation and things like if, if you are in rental accommodation, you often want to make your house your home. And at the moment, uh, in Ireland particularly, we always come with furnished properties. Um, in Europe, it's much more common to get unfurnished pro properties. Um, and if people are living in long-term rental accommodation, that they have the ability to actually create the home themselves out of the rental house and their own rental property. And also providing for things like um, model tenancy agreements where you have the right to have pets. Um, and then that can be adjudicated on adjudicated on um, with the RTB. So they're the kind of main issues as I see them. Um, I'm interested to hear what the other panellists say. I know um, Ivan's probably going to come at a very different perspective on the whole area of renters' rights. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Sean. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. And if I could just remind people if they want to pop, pop any questions into um, into the uh, comment box on Facebook, and I'm keeping an eye on that here, it's a little bit as people who've done these meetings know, it's a little bit disconcerting because Facebook runs 20 seconds behind um, uh, behind uh, behind Zoom. Uh, so there's great fun for those people who don't know what we're doing. We're having our meeting here on Zoom and then it's being broadcast uh, live uh, on Facebook. So uh, that's where, where uh, we're at with that. So look, I might ask Michelle now to to come in and give us her overview on the situation. Um, I, I was told at the beginning there was a little bit of a bother with, with the sound. I hope it's 
rectified and that the that that is the echo has gone out of it and that we're a little bit little bit uh, better. So Michelle, uh Ligamid Dirt, crack all the right. Still on the muse, I'd say Michelle. Uh, Gord Ma got the Sean. Um, so I'll just um, being a um, an academic, I, I felt I couldn't cope with that slides, so I only speak. So I did a short presentation, just ten minutes. Um, so as Sean mentioned, I uh, I work at UCD. Um, uh, I am in exile in Dublin from from South Kilkenny, uh, which is always painful. Um, also, um, as well as my academic work, which focuses mainly on housing and particularly social housing provision, which is one of my one of the main areas of interest, I chair the board of the Housing Finance Agency, which is one of the agencies that finances social housing in this country. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And I'm also on the board of the Land Development Agency. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about their, their work or my own personal take on, on their work. Obviously, I'm just one member of the board. Um, so, minutes to speak. I was told to, I was told to be brief by Sean. Um, so it's ironic, Michelle. We know. About I know. <laughs> Sean and I, uh, um, anyway, know each other for many years and we've been labour youth together. So Sean will know. I, I'm never brief, but anyway, I was told to stick to ten minutes. So, what I thought I would do is just discuss kind of three main issues relevant to the debate on social housing. Um, Firstly, the level of investment required, how effectively we use the spending, the investment. And then the, the third issue, which Rebecca alluded to, the capacity to deliver on this investment. So to actually spend investment in, in practice. Um, so um, this graph just looks at spending, public spending on um, social housing and what civil servants call social housing supports things like HAP and leasing um, since the 1990s. And you can see the, the trend, the interesting trend in the, in the graph um, is that firstly, spending has gone up and down over the period. And we, we have a long-term problem in Ireland of kind of boom bust spending on social housing. So you may remember Charlie McCreevy said, when we have it, I have it, I spend it. That's what happens here. And then there's very significant cutbacks then whenever there's a, a recession. We saw it in the 80s, and then we saw it in the late uh, noughties as well. Um, so in recent years, in my opinion, spending has just been far too low compared to other Western European countries. In view of the fact that we're one of the few European countries where the population is rising very dramatically. And during periods of huge growth in, in population in, in other Western European countries, in Britain, in France, in Germany, in Denmark, the market never delivered adequate housing supply. So after World War II, when the population rose in all those countries, the social housing sector delivered the supply necessary, particularly to people on, on average incomes and below. And I, I personally can't see any alternative here. We also have a very unequal labour market as, as um, many people here will know, and I know the Labour Party has campaigned on. So we have a lot of people in low paid employment, for instance, who are, are very unlikely to be able to afford to purchase. Um, also in Ireland, it's quite unusual in that the social housing sector is almost entirely state funded. I can talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. Um, and uh, after the, um, from the early noughties, the government relied more on private rented sector through HAP and through um, uh, things like rent supplement and most recently through leasing to um, accommodate people who in the past would have got social housing, but there just isn't sufficient availability. Um, also things like HAP and um, leasing and RAS simply underpin rents, so rents don't fall below the HAP level or the rent supplement level. So it creates affordability problems for other people in the market. So in my view, uh, there's definitely a need for more investment. And we also need to address this long-term problem of investment going up and down, because we have a continuing problem where we tend to spend money when housing is very expensive. And then when the market crashes, we cut back. And when we, we should be spending money as a government to support 
you know, employment in the building industry and to get better value, but we're not doing it. So, so we need to come out and break that cycle. Um, so as many of you are aware, the latest housing strategy from the government housing for all um, for, uh, promises a very large, substantial amount of spending on, on social housing, 20 billion over the next five years, and a guaranteed 4 billion per annum. So that's a doubling of the spending levels we've seen up to now. And in my view, I have concerns about aspects of what's proposed in Housing for All, but the, the big picture is the money, because uh, nothing can happen without the money. And I think the, the, the spending is very good news, and it's um, very important. And it also addresses the issue about spending going up and down. It's, it's guaranteed for five years. Now, we still have to address the long term, but the, this is the key problem. And many commentators have raised kind of very pernickety issues about housing for all and they've missed this fundamental point which is the money um, so we now have the money so second point do we use the public investment um effectively and particularly compared to other western european countries that have bigger social housing i don't know if anyone snuck in from across the border in waterford but um, you might recognize the picture which is ballybricken green street ballybricken in, in Waterford, which is the first um, council housing scheme built in Ireland. It was built um, before government funding for social housing was introduced. Actually, Waterford Corporation raised a bond on the stock market and built Green Street. So back, but I noticed when I went down to take the picture, they hadn't. Um, so Green Street was built in 1884, I think. And since then, uh, local authorities have built around 360,000 council houses. So if you work that out as a percentage of the total housing stock, that's 22% of the total housing stock in Ireland. And councils now house 8.7% of all households. So the difference between the 8.7% they currently own and the 22% they built is privatization, it is tenant purchase. So to put that into context, if we hadn't sold the houses, our social housing sector would be the same size as Denmark or Austria or France or countries we're told we should aspire to be. So in my view, the, the, the policy works differently in different areas. So in rural areas, it's often easier to replace the dwellings. In cities, a lot of the dwellings are irreplaceable and uh, they're currently sold at 40 to 60 percent below market value and councils have to replace them at market value. Um, so effectively, it's that much of a loss to the, the state. So Housing for All promises to reduce the discount to 25%. Um, this should be implemented and go further, in my, in my opinion, in urban areas. So just another, um, this isn't the only way in which we lose the benefits of um, historic investment in, in social housing. So if, if you compare us to places like Denmark, houses they built in the 1950s and paid for in the 1950s are still providing social housing today, whereas in Ireland they're not. So that's a key problem. But we also lose the invest value of investment in other ways. So one of them is leasing social housing, which Rebecca has very correctly called out as very poor value for money for the taxpayer. But also uh, council tenants have the right to inherit their tenancies or their, their children um, have the right to inherit their tenancies. And obviously spouses and vulnerable adult children should have the right to inherit a tenancy. Um, and spouses or, or partners are usually co-tenants anyway, so they get to keep it. But out, outside that, I, I think it's, ar it's arguable it should, be, it should be restricted. And in rural areas, particularly in the west of Ireland, it's actually a major loss of, of council housing. We also have very, very large levels of vacancy in the council sector. It's about 5,000 units at the moment. So there's only about 7,500 homeless people. So that's men, women and children. Um, so if those dwellings were in, available for letting, the homelessness problem would be solved. And then just the final issue I just wanted to highlight is in the past, councils were the main providers of council housing. They're not anymore, and uh, approved housing bodies, as sometimes they call them housing associations, are now providing about 50% of output. 
Um, so approved housing bodies are funded by loans from the housing finance agency and they pay off the loan. And once they pay off the loan, they're not under any obligation to continue to let the dwelling at a social housing rent. They could, for instance, charge a market rent and ask people to claim half. So to, to my mind, I don't understand why the government allows that to continue, to be honest. And just to let you know, there's about 35,000 AHB tenancies countrywide. About 7,000 were provided in the 90s and are currently coming out of mortgage. And the dwellings built by the AHBs in recent years are funded by a loan from the Housing Finance Agency and then a lease payment, which is 92% of market rent. So it's actually more expensive than private sector leasing, which is leases 75% of market rent. Um, but yet at the end of it, we're not sure it will be social housing. So in my view, that is something we definitely need to address. And Rebecca mentioned the similar issue about cost rental, this new form of housing tenure we're going to have. If we're increasing spending, we need to ensure that the value of the spending, the value of the investment, the money raised from taxpayers remains in the system to benefit future generations and, and the public good. And the kind of final point I wanted to raise is just around how we can spend the money in housing for all and hopefully continuing higher, higher finance. And one of the, the points I wanted to raise is, which isn't really raised in the public debate, is that there are really significant constraints in the social housing. I mean that delivering the, the number of dwellings we need is challenging. And Sean Patik mentioned um, the need to build dwellings from scratch. And one of the reasons we need to do that is because most people on the council housing waiting list are single people, mainly single men, or two people households, typically a, a lone parent and, and child. And about 85% of the council housing stock we have is three bedroom and bigger. And the, the, the small units we have are often reserved for older people's accommodation. So if you're a single man, for instance, in your 50s, needing council housing, your chances of getting it are between slim and nil. And that's why they make up such a large proportion of the homeless population. So we need to build more small units within the, the social housing sector. And that should be that should be a key focus. And, and to do that, we need to build from scratch, not to, to buy dwellings, complete it, estates from developers. Um, but there's huge um, difficulties in terms of delivery. So I've mentioned here, um, Last year, local authorities built from scratch um, 2,230 uh, dwellings. They leased a similar number and they, they bought 833 dwellings. But that figure of 2,000 includes dwellings that they regenerated. So the you know, big regeneration schemes we see in the, in the cities and flats complexes. So, so not all of it is actually new. And the other big problem is in cities where need is greatest so uh, need is, is significant everywhere but the homelessness figures are highest in cities but the output of council housing is lowest so i've, I've put a list here of uh, of the the worst offenders in terms of councils um so john leary ratdown county council where i live uh in john leary um built no units last year they didn't also they didn't take any units in under part five either Limerick City Council built 19, Cork City 76, Fingal County Council 76, Dublin City Council is a bit better, 140. Uh, but, but just by contrast, Kilkenny City and County Council, as I still like to call them, built 63 units last year for a much, much bigger, smaller population than Dunleary, and Carlo built 50. So the Dublin local authorities um, in particular are, are simply not delivering, and there are challenges with getting Department of Housing approval, but I also feel councillors and members of local authorities should call out management on their activity, because if we're going to solve the crisis, we really need everyone to be building. In the AHB sector, the approved housing body sector, then um, Housing Finance Agency uh, lent uh, a billion last year to the sector. Because of COVID, only about half of that was drawn down in loans, but they, you know, the loans will be drawn down as the year that uh, this year progresses and the dwellings are built. 90% of that money was lent to four organizations, uh, Cluid, Respond Housing, which are based in Waterford, a Southeastern organization, to a housing and cooperative housing Ireland. And actually about 85% of it was lent to the first three of those. 
So we're really dependent on a very small number of organizations to achieve the supply we need. And, and that's a problem. I think we need to address the factors constraining supply of all types of housing, not just social housing. And I, I mentioned to, to Rebecca and colleagues in the Labour Party, in some ways, the biggest challenge we face is to private builders to build first time buyer housing at affordable. Um, anyone who can work out how to, how to resolve that, I think, deserves prize, maybe even a Nobel Prize, um, because in the private development sector, there's big problems in access to finance, particularly bank lending. And this is one reason why um, investment firms are so powerful. They provide about 72% of the finance for private developments at the moment. But there's also problems in relation to labor supply, demand for other things like commercial construction. And there's things like insurance problems, regulation problems, creation problems for small firms. And uh, I'm concerned that in, the, in, in Dublin, Cork, um, Galway, we're reaching a situation where there's kind of a monopoly developing. There's very few firms that are in a position to, build, to bid for big contracts. In the local authority sector, there are issues with Department of Housing approval, which can be slow, staff capacity and expertise, access, access to land. Some local authorities have a lot of land, some don't. Um, access to funding for land servicing and, and the planning system. But it, it, in my view, those issues need to be addressed. They still don't explain the, the low supply in, uh, in the Dublin local authorities. And then in the approved housing body sector, there's issues with the small number of organisations very active. So as, as I mentioned, it's quite precarious in my view, in terms of the number of organisations we have the capacity to build social housing. Um, for the social housing sector, managing big, big projects um, can be very, very challenging. I think the Land Development Agency is very important. Um, it should play a role in putting together land banks and um, assembling sites. Um, it's focusing in particular on the larger cities, um, and it should make more land available to local authorities and AHBs to enable them build from scratch the smaller units and cost rental units. Um, and it has, a, a, I think, an important role to play in developing large sites where there's capacity problems within the other social housing providers would, would stop them developing. So in my view, it should be a partner to the other suppliers, not a competitor, because actually the scale of the need is such that we need everybody to be supplying. Then just some additional kind of issues I wanted to flag. I mean, I think there's very significant labor shortages um, within the construction sector. And to my mind, that makes some of the targets in housing for all about refurbishment of housing very challenging to, 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 to meet as well as new delivery. Um, we, I mentioned we really need more small units if we're ever going to solve the crisis. And nearly all the output is family sized houses, um, three bedroom and up. And I sometimes get annoyed when I hear people complaining about new apartment blocks and they're, they're not family housing. I, I, you know, I, I have three kids and a husband and myself, but I, I don't think you have to be a, a household like me to be a family, you know. Um, so I just don't like that term, but it is really important we build more small units. And I personally think factory construction, semi prefabrication, those kinds of things are going to be vital to try to achieve more output and also to cut costs. So in Ireland, we, we use all that building hotels, we, we use all that building offices. For some reason, we don't use it very much in, in residential construction. So I think we need to, to look at that as well. So thank you, everybody. And I'll now stop sharing. Sean, you need to unmute yourself. There are many people who have been trying to mute me for years, Rebecca. Um, Zoom manages to do it for them. But anyway, Ivan is laughing there. He's uh, a little bit a little bit too enthusiastically. But um, no, look, that was very valuable. And I think we've, we're already seeing that we're we're having some some interesting points here where we're, where we're going to have an active discussion. Uh, there are a number of interesting comments that have come in. 
um, on uh, Facebook and just one by text here from Mara Shortle, who everybody knows, um, who's tuned into this meeting. And he, it makes an interesting one, Rebecca, maybe just to, to throw, a, throw a quick ball in. He says, I hate the term social housing. It should be community housing. What does Rebecca think? And that's specifically for you, Rebecca. Um, uh, so I, I let you I let you answer that one and then we'll bring Ivan in. <laughs> I've no problem with what it's called, as long as people who are earning below a certain amount and can't house themselves get housed. Um and get housed in adequate housing within a good time frame. You know, like what it's called doesn't really matter. Um, I suppose there's another debate around public housing, and that's I think because the cost of housing, um, and and the, the limits are very low actually, because that's that's something that I think needs to be addressed. The limits are really low, and I was just talking to um a colleague of ours down in Wexford, uh, Councillor George Lawler, and he was saying that working families payment is now taken into account in some local authorities, but not all local authorities as to whether or not you hit the limit. And there's no, um, and, and we've been promised for a long time, John O'Sullivan put the legislation in place, there's no um, so di differential rent scheme, um, a uniform differential rent scheme across the um, country. And they have very different income disregards that are in it. So when you look at the different local authorities, they have a very different uh, viewpoint of it. And things like, some include things like family income supplement and some don't. Um, but actually, the, the limits for social housing are incredibly low when you look at them, and they haven't been um, revised, I think, since 2016 um, was the last time that they were revised and looked at. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and that's why I think you have a clamour for things like cost rental and what's considered to be public housing, um, because it's very difficult to even meet the criteria for being on social housing. And we have a, a thing in Dublin where people who... The local authorities were left with a number of part five affordable housing properties at the time of the crash. Um, and if you remember the crash, we did have supply because so many people moved away. And so they offered it on a um, rent to buy um, basis. So you were renting it and then you were able to buy it. And they're now going back and saying, well, you have to both qualify for it when you qualified for it. And then 11 years later, you still have to qualify for affordable housing. And those kind of small discrepancies, those large discrepancies for the impact on people across local authorities, I think, are the problem. But I don't care what it's called as long as people get help. There is there, there you go. That's a comprehensive answer from ours. So we'll 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 take that. Uh, so uh, pardon the sound of barking dogs in the background here, by the way. If any of my family are tuned in watching this on Facebook, they might quieten the dogs, but that's another day's work. Uh, I'm gonna ask Ivan Shannon to come in and uh, I suspect he'll have a slightly different take on things. Are you going to share yourself, Ivan, or will I share your PowerPoint? You'll need to come off mute. If you can share, please. Sean. No bother. That's grand. I'll get it up here and we will get a crack in. And you can tell me when to move on, Ivan. Um, so we'll work away with that. Yeah, sure. That's self-explanatory if you want to move on. So basically, the reason why I've looked at this report is it's the first time that there's been an in-depth view of what, land, what landlords and what the landlord sector is in the country. Um, and for, they've actually uh, categorized landlords into three groups, being small landlords, one to two tenancies, medium size, three to 99, and then large landlords over 100. Next one, please, Sean. And it, the key point in this is there's an acknowledgement of the, the numbers leaving the industry thing. And it's basically, it's fallen by more than 5,000. We will see later that it's greater than 5,000 uh, in the last, last five years. So next one, please, Sean. Yeah. So these are just some of the key facts and the next few will go through some of the key facts of, I mean, what is the small landlord? And fundamentally, the first one is, there are 85% of, of all landlords, private landlords, and it's 53.5% of all private tenancies. And the findings here is actually putting it into, we're now seeing who are landlords and what, what are their, their own components. So in this case, they usually view themselves as part-timers. They usually are own, have their own properties, 
But, and if you move on, Sean, we will see that the, yep. a lot of them were actually bought these properties, over a half of them bought them as owner occupiers. And then they moved on they, because they had their properties for a number of years. The average is 14 years, but there were tenants, the landlords for 10. So for the first four years on average, they were living in the properties and they, they decided then to rent. So the profile of a landlord has now been clarified. They aren't, the country isn't full of big multinationals, the REITs and, the, and the so forth. They are normal people just moving, doing what they are doing and trying to survive. Next one, please, Sean. Um, the next one is- Sorry, we're going to- okay. go. Yeah. And just, it's just that what we're going through here is the age profile of them. So they are, I mean, they, there's an age and a buy to let, who buys them mean, and then how there is a difference between the Dublin, the small Dublin landlord and the small landlord from outside of Dublin and what kind of properties they own. And I mean, so you're probably in the country, you're going to be renting a house off a small landlord and he's going to have either one or two properties. Next one, please, Sean. And so we have there that the smaller landlord has 81% of them have one property. It is not a big, a big business. It's a, a small business, but it's still a business. But the important one here is that 9% of all small landlords are looking to sell in the next 12 months. And another further 9% are unsure what's going to happen. Next one, please, Sean. And these are the reasons why landlords are leaving. Now, if you take the first one, is that I believe is a combination of where you could be one or two of the of the, the, the other six and landlords are leaving. And people might find some of this shocking, I mean, because people think it's not all of it's profitable. Well, 30% of them think they're leaving because it's not profitable or their taxation is too high. And so it isn't all, everybody might look at it and say, landlords are making loads of money, but I think the, there's 9% of them are saying that they're, they want out. I mean, and if we just kind of put it in, con, uh, in context, next one, Sean, please. I mean, we have this chart shows the decline of, on landlords going from uh, fourth quarter 2016 down to fourth quarter 2020. And as, there's a, uh, as a percentage, it's dropped down to 94.5% overall drop. The next one, Sean, please. This is from the uh, RTB, again, showing the steady decline of private uh, rented tenancies. Next one, please, Sean. And here we are and what, what it means, that if 9% leave, we're looking at just under 15,000 landlords and approximately 17,750 tenancies lost. Now that's lost to the system. And this, that's greater than the three years before. And this could be even worse if those 9% that aren't sure of their intentions decide to go over and just sell. Next one, please, Sean. There's two possible solutions, and I won't go through it, but it Landlords are, rental income is not deemed to be earned. Now, ask a landlord who's trying to I mean, make his, keep his property correct. He works at it. I mean, it doesn't just happen. So, I mean, at the moment, we're not taxed. Landlords, small landlords like myself are not taxed the same as the REITs. And we're not, we haven't got the... We haven't got on from the next slide, you see the pensions, our pension rights, we can't use any excess into pensions either. And this is important because from 
the reasons why landlords are leaving is because they see the property as part of their pension plan. So now they're looking at, well, we can't, we, we are going to leave because the tax system won't allow us to have a pension I mean, with, with any excess. Next one, please, Sean. So, I mean, this is basically where I think we are. I mean, Daft this week came out the lowest amount of stock for rent. Now that has to, that means something. I mean, there is constant talk of either a ban on rent increases or rent below inflation increases. I mean, now I personally believe that will accelerate the decline in small private landlords. And what will that mean? That those that that nine percent is unsure, some of them will mean go. And you could question why not if they're not going to get rent increases, and the curtain, the figures coming from the CEO mean showing oh, nearly up to fifteen percent increases in, in in house prices. When you've got one or two properties, I mean, and you've been told that you're going to have a, a ban depending on which political party is it three years or two years or whatever you're going to consider selling and every time one is sold I mean that it is lost to the rental market and I've seen from my own estate they are not the rental properties are normally bought up as by people looking for first-time buyers but they can afford them I mean it's the people who can afford. So it's the higher element of the rental of the of earners. High earners are actually able. So we the question is: Do we need maybe a new true report or do? And what happens if the small landlord actually vacates? I mean, if he walks if he walks out on mass and they vacate, the numbers we're looking at here are greater than. The ambitious numbers that the government are hoping to build I mean so I mean where 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 is the the housing market going if small the small landlord walks away next one please Sean so I leave because Ronan Lyons knows a lot more about this than I do but I, this is actually from the current staff report and we can see here, I mean, that in his view, prices are rising because of lack of rent accommodation. And until we fix supply, I mean, we're going to have the same problem. But if landlords leave, the problem is going to get worse. So this view of banning rent increases and not facilitating the landlord either through taxation, another form of taxation, or allowing, treat them as like any other I mean, uh, income, and allowing them to have pensions, allowing them to work in, in, a, in a level playing field with the REITs, you are going to find more and more small landlords with one and two properties saying, Thank you very much. It was good while it lasted, but I am gone. And that's where I think it's actually moving towards. And that's why there is 9% looking to, 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 or likely or very likely to sell within the next 12 months. So looking at the figures of what the local authority built and the potential loss to the marketplace, right? There's, yes, I think it could destabilize the mark, the overall housing market even further if the small landlord is not acknowledged and I mean, looked at new solutions to how we can deal with their issues because they will just walk away because it's 9% this year, it could be ending up the fair. Uh, in the next 12 months, 24 months, it could be 18% of the total of the total price market standard would be gone. That's that's what I see see where it's going. You can look out in the morning, Sean, just across from Robert's Hill, 
and there's a housing state and they're starting at, the advertisement is 285,000. I mean, it's a starting price and they are two bedroom, two to three bedroom units. I mean, looking at the mats, they're not going to be affordable. I mean, so, I mean, there's still going to be people who will need, I mean, apartments, they will need accommodation, they will, will need that small landlord to provide, but it seems to be, I mean, open season on landlords at the moment. That's my bit, Sean. Okay, dog, and uh, I'm going to try and and uh, get the, the screening finished. Have I managed to take it down there by mistake? No, um, it's still there. Thank you. Yeah, it's down there. So, um, I, Ivan, thanks a million, and thanks to Colette for for lending her name uh, to the to the Zoom connection. And um, uh, I know that she's a woman who has opinions on these matters as well, and and quite strong ones. But I think look, that has given us a perspective. I suppose I'm one of these old-fashioned socialist that grew up listening to um, the first Moving Hearts album, uh, and there's a famous track on that about landlords, and uh, uh, we, we won't apply it to you, Ivan, um, uh, but it's from maybe another time, um, but I'm quite sure this is going to generate debate. Before we get into the Q&A and into uh, just looking at the questions, I think it would be worth reading out the questions that we've gotten here and um, from 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 members and non-members, and uh, just to 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 um, mention a couple of the points that that they've mentioned there. Fergus Whitty, who is a member of our own and and uh, a former trade union official in uh, in London, um, Fergus uh, says, "What about houses that are left empty?" I noticed walking up to Castle Coma Road in Kilkenny that some four or five houses were empty, uh, some unoccupied for a long time. What proposals would be appropriate to encourage the owners of such houses to release them to enable uh, the homeless to be housed? Uh, and then from Gary Lynch, who is a tenant himself, I'm sure he, he, he he's quite happy for me to say that. He said, any discussion about elderly renters who are precarious tenants, despite being heavily subsidised under the Ross scheme, uh, who rely on a highly opaque set of security of tenure rules. Okay, so Gary wants to know our views on that. And then finally, Paul Brophy um, uh, asks, says Rebecca is correct. Uh, qualifying the limits for quali the qualifying limits for social housing are way too low, should be closer to the average wage, cost rental, rent to buy, and affordable housing could be good options uh, for those people. Rent to buy could be a really good thing as it was hugely successful in the past. And I think those are the main questions that I've got in so far. If anybody else wants to pop any other questions in the chat, uh, they'd be very welcome. So I suppose we go back to, to you, Rebecca. And um, I mean, obviously Ivan has, has given the perspective and I suppose some of the figures are, are you know, they're, they're, some of the figures are, are a little bit new to me, I'd have to say, and, and point out to the clear um, uh, percentage of the mar rental market uh, that is, occupied by, I, I suppose, the, the phrase we've gotten used to is the accidental landlord. And I mean, I know Ivan would draw a distinction between the accidental landlords and the people who, you know, have decided to do this as a small business, or as he said, investing in um, in, a, in a pension. And, and it, that's a live issue in many of our houses uh, where people who are self-employed um, unfortunately have don't have access to decent pension schemes and the traditional view of that is that the bricks and mortar is probably the most solid um, uh, pension pot that you can have um, and that the way to, to maintain that is to continue with your residencies. I suppose said against that, I'm not sure if Ivan was here uh, when I spoke about the meeting that we had with Mary Mulholland who's the director of services during the year. And I suppose when we get into difficult questions like um, like rent freezes and um, uh, guarantees of longer term tenancies, you know, the stark figure of 53 families in, in, in County Kilkenny between now and Christmas being faced with eviction, many of them perhaps by the, the, land, the very landlords I even spoke about who are thinking about getting out of the business, want to sell, want to go down another route. Um, but the fact that, that that these families find themselves in such a difficult position. So I'll come to Rebecca first, then to Michelle, and then to Ivan, and we'll maybe rotate some of the questions in the next while. Yeah, perfect. Um, 
so I suppose a bit like you, Sean, um, I'm an old fashioned socialist as well. And I just fundamentally don't believe that you have the right to have somebody else um, pay your mortgage at a, uh, at, at, at a disincentive to them. Um, and that you essentially inherit a capital asset or you have a capital asset and somebody else is paying the mortgage over periods of time and don't, don't have the security of tenure. Um, that you, ha- you, see, you see in other countries. And I also think it's really interesting in the figures that I even pointed out there um, in terms of the, the older profile of um, generation of landlords. And I think there's a real gap that's opening up between older people who have both their own property and security in their own property. And like I own my own home and um, my mortgage is a proportion of my income is much smaller than it was when I started owning it. And but rents have doubled, right? So it, it's very, very different. My mortgage has actually gone down as opposed to if I was in a renting, my rents would have doubled over that time period and um, that, that that I've owned. But what I, Ivan is saying is also true in that there is huge pressure on the private rental market. And I think that ties back into what Michelle is saying that we don't provide as much social housing and there was a reliance on providing it through HAP rent supplement and now through leasing. So what we do see happening in a homeless crisis is people are primarily coming from the private rented sector and landlords leaving um, is a short term problem in terms of doing that. I would take it issue with um, Ivan's thing. He's saying that, that they are then lost to the system and those houses are built. They're still there. They still be still used as housing in a home for somebody. Um, and we shouldn't see a situation that they're allowed to be there and to be left empty. Um, I want to just touch on the point around um, elderly people renting, because I do think that this is a crisis coming down. And you hear Ivan talking about some people invest, investing in a property in order to be paying for their pension. But a lot of long-term renters neither have a pension nor do they have security of tenure in the house that they live. And they have rents that are rising um, and they're gonna have a big drop off in income. And I think in 10 to 15 years, I think we're going to see a big problem with people who haven't been able to afford to buy um, themselves who are renting. They will either be then reliant on half in the state again, um, but there's gonna be a huge problem of older people who have insecure tendencies that are there. And again, I think that goes back to my point that I fundamentally think that tenants' rights should always be greater than the rights of landlords and that's a political positioning that I have and that's where my sympathies lie. Okay before I bring Michelle in I'm going to go to somebody that I think both Rebecca and Michelle and probably Ivan in, in fact I uh, know a fellow called Sean Butler um, and Sean says surely we need a mixed housing model there is a need for housing both social and private but there's also a need for a rental market and I suppose this is the topical issue. Students and young people increasingly do not want to buy. And I'd have to say in the place I work, I'm beginning to hear this from younger teachers. And I think many of us are beginning to hear it from, from you know, that, that maybe we're slipping into the European model of not being obsessed with having our own two up, two down, with a back garden and a front garden. And people actually settling into a life of the Dutch model or the, Danish model or the Austrian model, the Vienna model, as it's called, where they're quite happy uh, to enter into long term rental situations with security of tenure and with the kinds of guarantees maybe that are in other housing markets that maybe don't exist to the same extent here. Could I bring you in on that, Michelle, if you don't mind, and just get your thoughts on on that? Mm. Well, I mean, the the structure of the population in Ireland has changed since the 1980s really dramatically and I think it's in some ways um, the problems we're grappling with in housing reflect that that these issues are never really brought into the debate so that you know when Sean and I were in Labour Youth together the population of the country was three and a half million the population is now hitting five million so fortunately that's an enormous increase we've also urbanized much more rapidly and we have a much much bigger population of um migrants and um uh, whereas you know 20 30 years ago the the population was um almost entirely um white irish as the census said so the housing system needs to 
reflect that, that, you know, we will have, we have a more diverse population. We have people who might want to rent in cities for a while, um, for longer than, than we have in the past. I mean, saying that, I personally think um, there are enormous benefits to home ownership. And um, it's one of the reasons I'm a supporter of the housing for all subsidies for home ownership. And um, one of the challenges we face in this country is we have a very weak pension system outside those of us who are lucky enough to be in the public sector. So for many people, really the making their living costs stack up when they're older involves necessitates having their mortgage paid off. And, um, uh, you know, someone mentioned earlier, I can't remember who, how we're going to grapple with this. Someone asked this, this question, and that is a big challenge because if, if people can't pay mortgages from their pension or can't pay rents from their pension, the state will end up paying it. So uh, um, that's one issue. Um, I, I think we need we need to to come up with a solution to, and I I think that's one reason why um, things like um, local government mortgages etc should be provided to enable enable people buy. Just on the landlords issue, I think we need to remember that nobody's obliged to be a landlord, so landlords don't have to let out housing, and if um, disincentives are put in place that are so acute, they won't continue to do so. So, you know, they don't have to provide the, the service. And I think the point Ivan was making is um, some of them will make a decision not to. And that is a that is a problem. It's not just a short term problem, because one of the issues that's relevant to Carlo Kenny Labour um, Group is it's also a geographical problem um, because, you know, we see in Dublin and Cork, you know, REITs and these famous investment funds, nobody seems to like building a lot of housing. Um, and it's it's quite controversial, but it still is new housing, still is expensive, but presumably somebody can pay the rent. But the Central Statistics Office published figures on this and the, the level of supply from that side outside Dublin and Cork is zero. So they're, they're not building in Waterford, they're not building in Kenny, et cetera. So the, the people providing rented housing in Carlow and Kilkenny are small landlords. So if there are if there are regulations put in place that discourage them out of the market, and Ivan mentioned the differential in tax, for instance, it's going to hit rural areas more than urban areas because there is simply no alternative supply. And have, I haven't heard anybody address that issue. Now, in my view, social housing is a, is a more... Um, preferable tenure for people uh, who are you know long term unable to buy but there's still many people who move to Kilkenny want to rent who need who need to be accommodated and I suppose that that is the challenge if small landlords eat the market it's it's rural areas it's the smaller urban centres that are going to be affected most there is no supply coming into Dublin and, and Cork via these you know institutional landlords for the time being anyway but they have shown no interest in investing outside there or are the odd place like Maynooth where there's a population working in Intel who can pay top dollar prices. So so that that's the challenge we face on on the um on the landlords. I'm not diminishing in any way people's the valid concerns people have about security of tenure um etc. Of course I totally acknowledge that and Rebecca is right to point out most homeless people come from the private rented sector the problem is just trying to balance balance it, the you know the system so so you're not getting rid of people who are providing badly needed housing and um, particularly outside Dublin and Cork. Okay Ivan can I bring you back in there and just give us maybe your reaction to some of that? Yes now I suppose I, just to back with something Rebecca said about why should somebody be paying somebody else's mortgage? But sure, the government, as Michelle has said, the approved housing bodies are getting paid by the state, and the state have very little at the end of the at the contract. I mean, does the state own the property the, of the approved housing body? No. Does the state or does the approved housing body have to rent at social and uh, social uh, tendencies at non-market uh, prices no so look this is what's happening i mean tenants are landlords are putting the properties out there it's a commercial thing 
when the Celtic Tiger uh, collapsed and, pro and rents went with it, the state didn't come back and say, oh, we'll prop up the landlords. No, free fall happened. And we and we and many, many tenant landlords and the buy to lets were in serious trouble. I am not a socialist. So I mean, I not that's not what I am. And I mean, you're entitled to your view and hopefully you allow me to be that mine. These the, the houses that will be sold will not be left empty. My own, I did an a analysis of the sale of properties in my own estate. The, the private rented properties were all bought and bought into uh, home ownership. So they weren't bought, but the people who were buying them were at a higher income levels than maybe the person who was previously renting. That's, that's just, and then we look at tenure neutrality. There, on, at the moment, the housing for all is the only gig in town is seen to be home ownership. I think the last time there was tenure neutrality, uh, William Penrose was a minister. That mean that's the last time that was actually in a document coming from housing policy that tenure neutrality was the favoured view. And until we look at putting the landlord and the, the tenant and the owner occupier on similar footings. I mean, not saying equal, but at least similar footings, we're always going to have the struggle and there's always going to be a power struggle. But look, it isn't, it's, the landlord is like in rural area, the landlord is actually somebody in your neighborhood. It is somebody that I mean that you will meet, I mean, and they are providing it. The state has not provided the houses because if the state had provided the houses, there would be no private landlords. The state didn't provide, and there was a need. And I mean, like like with HAP, it is illegal for a landlord to refuse HAP. That's the law. I mean, that's the reality of it. Ivan, you're, you're, putting, you're putting two songs into my head here, or neither of which should be coming into my head. Uh, one of them is from Sesame Street, which is that the landlord and his neighbour should be friends um, and the people that you meet as you're walking down the street. And the second one might be a little bit more controversial, which is that the cowboy and his neighbour should be friends, uh, which is an old country song, but I won't make any comment about who the cowboy might be. But uh, listen, I think we, we've had a very fruitful discussion and... Um, and, you know, we don't all need to think the same. We don't all need to believe in the same things. And I think, you know, there is an active discussion going on here. And um, I think it's very important. And, and Rebecca has said this on quite a number of occasions that we listen as well as speak. And, and it was something that Alan Kelly said over the weekend. Um, and that, you know, we accepted that there are nuances in the situation. I suppose I would have to say from a political perspective in Kilkenny, we are the place of Seamus and Jimmy Patterson. We are the place of Anne Phelan. We are the place where Labour ministers built um, estates like St. Fiacre's Place and, um, as we call it, the Holy Land, not too far away from you, Ivan, in, you know, Father Murphy Square and Father Albert. And I suppose one of the little observations I might have myself from my own period as a councillor, and it's one of the, the whole issues, and then Michelle touched on, on the... The, the, um, the, the subsidy for, for purchase. Uh, we found we had a very unusual situation in the, the early noughties where the council suddenly started buying back properties in former existing local authority estates, like the places that I mentioned. And the people who, from their perspective, had purchased the houses in which they grew up, many of them, um, in those traditional council houses, were suddenly finding that there were new social housing tenants arriving on their doorstep. Some of them maybe with issues, not all of them, and many of them um, and with, without a glitch in the world. But there was a bit of a resentment there that something that in a way had become almost like a middle class estate purchased by people who had the wherewithal to do it and at good rates from the county council suddenly found that they had social uh, housing tenants beside them again. 
And I think as a party, we'd be in favour of a mixture in all of those areas. And I suppose the other question uh, that's there is in some of the areas which were bounding on the traditional local authority areas. And, and I mentioned the butts here, where there was quite a controversy about a packet of local land right beside a considerable existing housing estate, uh, which was local authority housing, that people were very uncomfortable about more social housing being put in that area. The other problem we had in the private estates, as I even will remember, is that we had people trying to shoehorn all of the social housing into the farthest corner of the site that they could possibly manage. So maintaining that kind of ghettoization rather than the mixture that was envisaged, I think, in the noughties where tenancies were going to be spread throughout a private uh, or a mixed tenure kind of kind of um, estate. So I suppose look, those are all questions you'd wonder, have we learned? You'd hope we've learned some of the lessons of what happened in the crash and that we'll have a more sensible policy um, going on into the future in terms of how this is going to develop. But I'd have to say from, you know, one of the things that we can say as Kilkenny citizens is when you look at the quality of some of the new social housing that's been built, like not a kilometer away from my own house here in, again, what was a kind of a controversial development in the Broadmaker site on, on the, the Castle Coma Road, a little pocket beside the Noor Bar of uh, single tenancies. Again, back to what both Rebecca and Michelle were saying about the, deba the demand for, for smaller units, a fabulous little development up of what was New Park Stores, and then a considerably bigger uh, development behind that, um, adjacent to Euros Bar just across the road um, in the area close to, to the barracks area. There's a lot of good stuff being done. The problem is the speed and the approach with which it's being done and how we're going to be able to deal with those issues of homelessness that are there. So would it be fair to give everybody two minutes to wrap up um, as to where we are? And I'll start in reverse, maybe. I'll start with, with Ivan and walk back. And um, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. You stayed with us for a while. Uh, I did say to Rebecca, we try and finish within the hour. We didn't manage that, Rebecca. Uh, there's talkers here um, and there were some excellent questions. And thanks to everybody who chipped uh, questions in. So, Ivan, I might get you just to, to give us a quick uh, sum up on your own position and, and where you think we should be looking at here on these issues. OK, thanks, John. Um, I suppose I'd put a different hat on, an old hat that I had when I was a developer. And the problem I see at the moment is we haven't got the people to build the houses. We may have the desire to build houses. We may even have the money to build houses, but we don't have the people on the ground to do it. We don't have the apprenticeships. They're not coming through. And we really need to look at the supply of labor, which, will, which feeds into the supply of houses. Once we can, if we can resolve that issue, I think a lot of other issues will start to become more uh, clearer. But I am reminded of one thing, of a lecture by Michelle and something she said, and it was about the bucket and the hole in the bucket. And if you, if it's, if you look at housing, social housing, community housing, whatever name of housing you want to call it, but if it's got a hole in it, and no matter how much water you pour into the bucket, if it's porous and it keeps on water coming out, we will not solve the system, but solve the problem. So we need to look at, if we are gonna build social housing, we have, it has to be retained and the ownership is important. And that leads into where is the approved housing bodies? Because it's very, like uh, social leasing has got a very bad rap. I mean, some people don't like private landlords, but really, are the approved housing bodies an awful lot better? I mean, and I mean, should we not look at even how are they constituted? Because if I'm correct, the um, cost rental scheme in Dublin, the, the, the flagship cost rental, will be retained in ownership by the, by the approved housing body so that's where we need to look at. We need to look at supply, but at the very, very basics of who is going to build. 
where are the young men, men and women who are going to build these houses? And then how do we keep the stock of houses for the people who need it? Because there is two systems, there's two streams. There's a private, there's always people who want to build, build and buy private houses, but there's always going to be a need for social housing. And we have to keep that stock because as Michelle said, the population has increased from three and a half million to five million. And we need to look at how we're going to house people going forward. And maybe in my view, mixed tenure is the one of the solutions for that. I mean, and we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a tenure neutral um, approach, just not everybody owning a house. I mean, because there's people who will just cannot afford to buy a house. I mean, I'm familiar one, one. Sorry, one, one last thing. Right. I mean, we need to turn around and say, how much is, how much can people afford? Is it 30%? Is it the overburden rate of 40% uh, in Europe? Is it 35%? So we know how much people of their income should be paying on, on rent or mortgage, or is it 25%? But we see, need to, that debate needs to be had as well. So what is affordable? Because it isn't clear what is a thought. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Ivan. And we'll crack on, Michelle, and just to give us your, your wrap up on things. Well, uh, kind of at the risk of stating the obvious, it's complicated. And, you know, there are no, in my view, no quick fix solutions. And any commentator, and here's some of this sometimes from fellow academics or political party that says there are quick fix and, and silver bullet solutions just simply isn't telling the truth. So, so I suppose that's one point I'd like to get across. Um, I see social housing as a very important part of the solution, particularly if it's built from scratch. And I feel that the local authority sector, um, particularly in the urban areas, but everywhere, has to step up to the market start to deliver. And I, I would encourage councillors who are um, participating in this call this evening to question the chief executive of your local authority about, about what they're doing and try to push them to do more. So, so just to say that. And then finally, um, if we are putting all this taxpayer money and, and public investment into social housing, we need to value it and manage it as the important public asset it is. So that involves maintaining it properly, not leaving it run down, and also ensuring that the investment we're making today is, is there to protect, is there for people in need in the, in the future. And other countries do that, so that there's nothing to stop us doing the same thing if there's political will, because we have to just break this cycle of um, selling off the social housing and then the next generation having to come in and provide it again. Um, you know, spending a lot of money at the top of the housing market with very poor value, and then not having money to intervene when the, the market crashes and building industry could do with investment to protect jobs. So uh, I suppose they're my kind of takeaway messages. Mila uh, Mahogut, Michelle, and uh, I'll uh, hand back to the party spokesperson. Um, not necessarily to give us the party line, but uh, I think a lot of that was outlined at the weekend. And by the way, could I suggest to people that they will go to labour.ie and that they would look at our housing policy documents and interact. And if people have different thoughts on the way things should go, to let Rebecca know those. I know from old that she's very open to new ideas and that she's very open to... to uh, engaging with people. So Rebecca, maybe if you might just give us give us the wrap up from, from your perspective and from the part. Yeah, thanks. And the affordable housing policy document, just to pay tribute to John O'Sullivan um, for pulling this together and the great work that John has done over a very long um, time period. Um, I, I, we have huge challenges, right? Um, we don't have just huge challenges in terms of supply, we have huge challenges in terms of capacity. Um, the number of people who are qualified. Um, we have huge challenges in terms of construction costs as well. And I think they all make it a much more kind of complicated and nuanced issue than, you know, this is a simple answer and if we do this. But from my perspective, um, active state involvement is key to that. 
And that's active and consistent state involvement because you know you're struck if you read about the history of housing from you know the 1800s onwards we go through housing crisis housing crisis housing crisis and um, from you know the tenements in inner city dublin to the housing crisis in the 1930s to the housing crisis in the 1970s uh you know the the cost of crisis in the 2000s where everybody was off buying themselves investment properties to the current rental crisis that we have now and the only way to counteract those Cyclic cycles are by you know consistent state investment in it, and um, I agree with Michelle on the right to buy. I know all my party colleagues don't necessarily agree with me, and um, I was one of the few people on Dublin City Council that voted against it when it was brought in as a new scheme. Um, but it just seems mad to me that we continuously sell off um, what should be considered to be a state asset, and then often have to end up either buying it back, because I know in my area a lot of it's bought back, or renting it at very high rates under HAP. Um, and I think we need to, if a house is affordable or been sold for an affordable, you then can't um, make huge amount of money after, and, and that be built in in perpetuity, not just for 20 years, which is a very short time frame in, in, in the lifetime of a house. Um, so I suppose just to finish off, Sean, by saying that it's not any, it is a nuanced discussion. Um, but I do think that consistent state intervention over the long term is what's needed to break out of our cycle of housing crisis from for, for, um, every couple of years or every generation. Listen, um, that's absolutely brilliant. And I think we've had a lively debate. We've had a lively discussion. Um, hopefully uh, we're just uh, starting it. I, I see from Michelle here. Thanks very much for inviting me. We're delighted to have you. Um, I think I'm going to leave the last word to a fellow who often gets the last word, and that's Gary Lynch. And Gary says on Facebook, he said, very interesting, fair play to Ivan, with whom I don't agree, but he made his points well, as did the prof and the senator. So to the prof and the senator and the landlord, um, uh, let's hope we'll all be friends. Um, I'm tempted after all the comrades uh, that we, we used over the weekend to say goodnight, comrades, but goodnight, comrades and friends. And I'm just looking here at Tomas uh, said here and, and, and Tomas Bernock. And, you know, I have to take my hat off to Tomas. He's had a long, long standing involvement on these issues and a very consistent record um, as a councillor in the tradition of the Pattersons. And, and I must mention Anne Phelan, who did decent work in this area as well um, as a TD from 2011 to 2016. But he said, would it be possible to get a copy of uh, both Michelle's and Ivan's presentations. And of course, needless to mention, being a councillor for the South Kilkerry, South Kilkenny area, he said, make sure to tell Michelle I said hello. So Tomas is always looking to make sure that that that, uh, that the electorate in, in South Kilkenny and all that belong to them are are uh, are kept on board. So Gurumina Mahabu Vikarda and Vishy Anahimul Vinasin on hand of us. And uh, hopefully, as I said, we'll come back to this again on occasions. As I said earlier on, the the, um, the director of housing and um, the the councils, uh, Tomas, will give me the correct title here. The council's response to the to Customs House uh, for the housing uh, for the housing for all plan, I think, has to be submitted by the 11th of December. And um, the director of services did say that she come back to us and speak to the members again when that um, response has been put together and get our views on it um, and uh, see where we're going to go with it. And then obviously to our four councillors, Tomas, Dennis, um, uh, Tomas, Dennis, uh, Willie Quinn and William Patton. And William gave his apologies tonight. As a true Labour councillor, he's attending a residence association meeting um, online in Tullow um, and is looking after the issues that people in, in, in these areas are, are looking for. So look, Gurumina Mahagiv, thanks very much for your time, um, all three speakers, and we look forward to engaging with you in the future and hopefully, um, it, on a very political point, hopefully having more councillors in Cardo Kilkenny and a Dáil deputy in Cardo Kilkenny um, in the not too distant future in order that uh, the Labour voice can be heard within this uh, discussion um, more clearly um, when it goes on into the future in Carlow Kilkenny. So, as I said, Gurmeel Mahagiv, thanks to everybody who tuned in, to those who with this, this uh, meeting will obviously stay on, on our Facebook page, and I hope that people will share it. I think it's a very valuable discussion, and it shows that we 
in uh, the Carlo Kenny Labour Party um, are very serious about issues that affect people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And Tomás is correcting me, he says it's the 17th of December is the date by which uh, Carlo County, or Kilkenny County Council, and I'm sure Carlo County Council as well, have to submit their plans to the Minister by that time. So once again, Gurmila Mahagaz, Ihava, and enjoy the rest of the night. Um, and we'll talk to everybody hopefully in the very near future. Slán Tamil. We we'll leave it at that, folks, and we'll 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 end it if that's okay. Talk to you all soon. Thanks very much. Bye -bye. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Thank Ivan. Bye, folks.